today at the museum at the McAvoy Shed. Tell me ready when you're ready. Okay. Oh, I'm not ready. A century-old bike sparks back to life. There. What? That's it, there. There's 75, fantastic. A young racing driver. Right, handbrake is on, magnetos are off. Goes back to basics in a Brooklyn's belter. Got it. And in the Vimy Pavilion. Was well, it how you remember it? Yes. Yeah, it yeah. looks incredible. The record-breaking Harrier and pilot are reunited. I can't believe this. I just wish it was real and I could get airborne again. I know, I want to hear it. Brooklyn's has always felt the need for speed. Its swooping banks were built with fast track times and record-breaking moments in mind. And this year the museum is celebrating a speedy centenary. In 1921, the first motorbike to officially reach 100 miles per hour on British soil did it here. Douglas H. Davidson clocked up 100.76 miles per hour on his Harley Davidson. And a fraction of a second slower was Bert Levac, riding an Indian Power Plus. The museum wants to commemorate the anniversary by recreating this historic moment with two similar period bikes. Here we go. Excellent. It hasn't fallen, fallen over, which makes, a, makes it very good. Well, we've, um, we've got the McAvoy shed ready for you, and Michael's over there at the moment. Jolly good. They've found an Indian Power Plus owned by Andrew Howe Davies but it hasn't run in living memory. Volunteers Perry Barwick and Michael Digby have the daunting task of getting it going. Michael, here's Andrew, owner of the Indian. Good morning. Hello, Andrew. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Flipping heck. <laughs> it's heavy. But elsewhere, Ian Dabney's heading up a Brooklyn's expedition. He wants to find the timing markers that the Harley and the Indian would have triggered at the start and the end of their record-breaking attempts. And he's roped in a gang of volunteers. So there was a timing system around the track with an accuracy of a millisecond. What I've got is where the original main timing markers were on the railway straight. The railway straight lies northwest of the main Brooklyn site. It's home to the flying kilometre, and if they've survived, the old timing strips. Ian's assembled his search party at the bottom of Test Hill, where they can get a good look at one of the old markers that has survived. Well, I never realised that that was part of the timing system. Yeah, apparently it was like a pneumatic tube with two or three metal strips with the wood on top. So as the vehicles went over, the wood went yep. down, compressed the, the tube, the contacts came together, connected the circuit, right. and that got sent round the telegraph poles to the timing system. Early 20th century Britain was obsessed with speed, and it was common for leading motorbike brands like Harley and Indian to be locked into piston-powered battles for top honours and global sales. So I was going to go out and see if I could find the timing markers for the start of the flying kilometre, the end of the flying kilometre, and right. I, you know, and I could do with a few more eyes. Yes. Yeah. And here we yeah. And there's a man with a wheel and a measuring yeah. thing, so we're going to do fine, I think. The railway straight was sold into private ownership when the aircraft factory at Brooklyn's closed, and the current owners have given them permission to look for the remnants of the speed system. We don't often get a chance to get here, do we? No. It's good. It's, it's good to be able to get some access to it. Despite being built on and redeveloped, the old track is clearly visible. You don't realise how wide it is until you're actually standing here and you look at it. It's obviously deteriorated over the years, but it can't have been that smooth right from day one. No, no, it wasn't. The search party are trying to spot the place where the block of wood and sensors would have been. What's that? That looks like it's been built purposefully. Wow. That's it. Yeah, straight across. That's what we want. The sensor would have been in here with the wood on top, the sort of rubber tube with the sensors, and the telegraph poles would have been here taking the signal. 
right the way back to the timing hut. 100 years ago, under the watchful gaze of a timekeeper, all eyes would have been on Brooklyn's. The Harley and the Power Plus would have crossed sensors like these and triggered the timing mechanism. With a start time, a finish time, and knowledge of the distance traveled, their speeds and the speeds of many who raced here could be calculated with the help of the Holden automatic chronograph pictured here. I'd have been excited to be here all those years ago, especially on the bikes of the day when with no rear suspension and about that much on the front and doing 100 mile an hour plus. Would have been quite no, an adventure no. doing 100 oh, miles an hour yeah, here. Yeah. Mind you, it was bumpy here. and Some of those, when they were laying flat on the tank, ended up with teeth like mine. For these keen bikers, finding the start line is a portal into Brooklyn's record-breaking past. I was thinking back 100 years, they would have all gone off, done one lap to warm up, come off the banking, yeah. and, and gone for it down that, that straight. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Mm. It's pretty impressive. It's a great start, and at least they know how far away the next marker will be. We've got some walking to do now. <laughs> yeah. We have. Right. Let's go. Set to zero, let's go. In 1921, Douglas Davidson took 22.2 seconds to go from the start of the flying kilometre to the finish line. And the volunteers' fancy measuring device tells them that the finishing line's timing markers should be somewhere close by. OK, guys, we're just about coming up to the kilometre mark. This is it. Right, well, it's rather overgrown, chaps. We're up for a bit of a scramble, I think. There's no trace of the markers where they're standing. But Ian's hoping they'll be visible on this privately owned banked section. I think is it's it? here. Yeah. yeah. There's a hole here. Yeah, no, it goes all the way up. Well, it's been well hidden over the years, hasn't it? Yeah. Fantastic, eh? First people to look at it for years and know what it is. The end of the kilometre. This is where he would have gone through at 100 mile an hour. This posse of volunteers have rediscovered the exact bit of record-breaking track they were searching for. Well done, us. Now all they need is the Harley and the Power Plus to be track ready for the centenary celebrations. But back at the McAvoy shed, camera operator Perry has made some unsettling discoveries. Right, Michael. Bit of a head scratch, I think. Brooklyn's bike volunteers love a challenge. In the McAvoy shed, Perry and Michael are trying to get an ancient motor ready to be ridden on an historic stretch of track rediscovered by the volunteers. I'm very excited to get this going. Virtually never see the Indian Power Pluses uh, over here in the UK. Uh, it was a very advanced bike for its time, very fast bike. They're working on a model which looks just like the Power Plus that tried to become the first motorbike in Britain to reach 100 miles per hour. That record-breaking attempt was made by Bert Levac. In just a few days' time, this bike, which belongs to Perry's friend Andrew, and an old Harley are destined to meet again to celebrate this speedy centenary. However, the Power Plus has been rusting away in a barn for decades and is in a sorry state. Perry and Michael have a mechanical mountain to climb. This is jammed. Nothing is turning, so he can't start the vehicle. Yeah. The Power Plus's levers, knobs and twist grips operate everything, from the throttle to the engine timing but many of them have long since stopped working. So this well, is what we're going to have to investigate today. Yeah. Just, just turn it a little bit. Yeah. It's quite yeah. jammed, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's not, I don't think it's jammed in here, though. The pair are puzzled by the bike setup. Oh, I've got a feeling there might be something else going on down here. Yeah, I think you might be right. Oh, I think we need to investigate this a little bit more. The twist grip operates a cable called the advanced retard which runs down to the magneto, a kind of generator that sends power to the spark plugs. So far, so good, but then things take a turn for the worse. Rather strangely, it runs another rod down to 
the valve lifter down here. The valve lifter helps stop the bike. The magneto helps it to start up and run. The twist grip is connected to both. Time for a conscious uncoupling. Do you think we should maybe release this mechanism off and see whether this is free running? Sounds like a good idea. So, uh, Will that pull out? It might just go if we give it a little wiggle. Oh, look at that, there you go. And that, look at that, that just, that just pulls out. So that's now operating just, just the, the magneto. Just the magneto. Well, should we see if that runs? Yeah. Well, look at that. Yeah. That look works, at that. That works fine, yeah. So now we know there's no jam in here. No. That's all. That's all right. So that's just working the advanced retard now. The advanced retard lever controls the spark plug timing. Well, that's good. So now we just need to solve this. They now need to figure out how a rider can manually operate the valve they disconnected from the twist grip. We've got, got some nice pictures and diagrams here. The owner's paperwork shows them the way and proves that the setup they're wrestling with was dumped in later models. In 1918, they changed this mechanism, mm -hmm. got rid of this rod, and if you look here, the valve lifter seems to run from the side of the tank. Mm. Looks like a better arrangement. It's a much better arrangement, isn't mm. it? Because then even if you're, you want to stop the engine, you can push this down or yeah. you can just advance and retard without touching the valve. Mm. Michael's going to create a new valve plunger made out of stainless steel that will run down the side of the tank and into the valve area. We're going to need a, a thread cut on the end of that because mm -hmm. I found a, a rather nice brass knob we could use for the top. He uses a tool called a die stock to create the thread that the knob will screw onto. Michael is one of these characters that's quietly spoken, never shows off about anything, and someone I look up to and respect. Should we try the, uh, try the knob on the end? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's looking like a pretty good uh, valve plunger, that. I'll, uh, mm -hmm. I'll let you. So, uh, oh, look at that, it's working perfectly now. This, this brass knob seems to fit in with the look of it all, doesn't it? Yeah. So, next thing, I guess, is we've got to try and thread it down the back of here and miss yeah. the hand gear change. And put a bend in it. With a small bend in it here. They use a bending tool to help the plunger stylishly swerve around some of the bike's curves. I'll just run that down through there, twist it again, twist it back that way. To, to put a vehicle back together to do what it was built to do. Uh, if you're a classic fan, that's, that's what drives you, I think. There we go. Down. That's down. Now, you try it, see if it works. Ah, oh, perfect. Look at that. That's how it's supposed to work. Well done. <laughs> I'll tell you what I've got for here, mm -hmm. is I've got a nice little bit of spring we can cut down to put in there, just to stop the fingers catching. That looks the part anyway. Mm -hmm. That's working, isn't it? Oh yeah, that's great. At Brooklyn, one of the things we all believe in is if it ran well once, there's no reason why we can't get it to do it again. And if we can get it running really well and put on a display for the public, even better. So I think that's a, a really good day's work. I think it works brilliantly. Next thing to do is uh, mm -hmm. get this off the bench. Yeah, and start it. Get it running again, first mm -hmm. time in a long time. Mm -hmm. I look forward to that. So do I. This bike is key to the museum's centenary celebrations. And whilst Perry and Michael have worked wonders, nobody yet knows if it will start, let alone run. Brooklands is bursting with bikes, buses, planes and cars that reveal how we've been racing and roaming around Britain in the past 150 years or so. Many are regularly ridden, driven and flown, as the ethos of the museum is to keep history moving. But some exhibits are so precious that only a select few are permitted to take them for a spin, like the Napier Railton. 
Alan, how are you? Morning, Orlando. Good to see you. And today, at Dunsfold Aerodrome, 23-year-old Orlando Lindsay has been chosen by ex-museum director Alan Wynne to get behind the wheel of this unique Brooklyn's exhibit. I think it's really important with all of these uh, museum objects to connect them with the present generation. The next generation are the people who are going to have to look after these things and keep on understanding them and keep on making sure that they are still valued and relevant to, to their era as well as to ours. There so, she is. Yeah, yeah well, this is it. My God, it looks absolutely gorgeous, doesn't it? Only four people in the world are permitted to drive the Napier. Orlando has the honor of becoming number five and of keeping a family motoring tradition alive. My grandfather, Patrick Lindsay, was the last person to own and, uh, and actually race the Napier Railton. So today I've been very, very lucky to be invited to come and drive the car. The Napier Railton was raced at Brooklands in the 30s, and in 1951, it started a new era of its life at Dunsfold testing aeroplane parachutes on this very site. As one of the fastest cars of its day, the GQ Parachute Company, based in Woking, knew the Napier was perfect for this extraordinary job. And when testing parachutes came to an end, Orlando's future grandfather and motor car racer, Patrick Lindsay, bought the Napier. I mean, it's so, it's so special. I mean, if you just look at it, it is absolutely ginormous. I mean, it looks like a basking shark. It's sort of gulping in air as it's sucking into its 24-litre aero engine. Orlando is the youngest person ever, as far as we're aware, to have driven the car. Um, we had to talk to the insurers about getting somebody under, under the age of 25 actually um, uh, being allowed behind the wheel. It's a really, really cool thing. I, I, I just can't wait. Yeah. Orlando has followed in his grandfather's footsteps and regularly races old cars in competitive events. It's an incredible thing. I mean, it's so big as well. You know, you don't really get that from the pictures so much because of it being so well... Uh, it, it's beautifully so proportioned. So well scaled, yes, yeah. Yes, every, everything is in proportion. I think there's either an instant connection or you just... You, you just don't understand it at all. Orlando's reaction was instant. So let's go and have a look at the cockpit because that, <laughs> that's what you've got to master. Sounds like a plan. Orlando has plenty of experience driving a variety of vintage and modern racing cars, but the Napier is notoriously difficult to handle. Thankfully, Alan is a past master. You can stick your head in there and I can uh, show you. So. Um, the seat is big and comfortable, and even though John Cobb was a really big bloke, uh, it's quite a tight driving compartment. Sure. So just put your right foot on the spring. Brilliant. And left foot over on the, uh, on the tank here, get the right foot inside, and then just slide both legs down at once. Okay. That's it, there you are. First, first thing is, can you push the clutch pedal to the floor? Just about. <laughs> Um, and then you do have a, a little handbrake here, which is just about capable of holding the thing on a, on on a, a level flat. road <laughs> uh, with a five knot wind blowing against it. Yeah. The Napier is equipped with a fly-off handbrake that has a quick release mechanism. On competition cars like this, it would have been used for a quick getaway from the start line. To, to release it, you just pull it back and it, and it flies off. Brilliant. And then to apply it again, you pull it all the way back and then put the trigger up. And uh, we've only got three gears here uh, to get you from a standing start up to theoretically 170 miles an hour. So there are enormous gaps between the ratios sure. in, the, in the gearbox. So the first couple of gear changes you'll find to be quite, quite an interesting experience. And the way you start this silver dream machine is pretty interesting too. So we're out, handbrake is on, magnetos are off. Orlando will need a posse of pushy Brooklyn's volunteers to get the car rolling. And right on cue, they arrive, ready to put their shoulder to the Napier wheel. So we just go, so clutch, throttle, brake, yeah. yeah. Put the ignition on and the handbrake off. Put the clutch down and just, just pull it back into first. There you are, that's it. It's a lot to take in and Orlando's feeling the pressure. Got it. Right, is everyone ready? Yep. 
It's a complicated car to master. One false move could damage this priceless and prestigious Brooklyn's exhibit. Enough. Okay. Right, so not yet. I'll shout to you and then you tell them clear. Right, now. On his first attempt, the Napier's engine roars to life. Well, he's just passed the biggest test, which is getting it started. Orlando finally has the chance to feel the sheer power of the Napier Lion aeroplane engine that his grandfather learned to master. Well done. That was, that was a brilliant start. Well done. So, um, yeah, I'd get on with it. Go and learn how to drive it. Those driving genes are alive and well. Orlando's nailed the Napier. I think Orlando's done really well. You know, for somebody who's, while he's driven uh, the old pre-war motor car, he's never tackled anything like this, and he's clearly loving it. You can just see the smile on his face as he as he comes round every time. You know. In a couple of the runs, I actually sort of almost envisioned being Patrick charging down or wherever he would have been. I definitely think my grandpa would have enjoyed that. I mean, he probably would have been like, go faster. <laughs> but I'm so, so grateful. Orlando's drive has been a roaring success. The Napier's future is in safe hands. At Brooklands, Andrew Howe Davis, who owns a prop hire company, would also like a ride on an old motor. Hello, Michael. Perry and Michael brilliantly overhauled his 1917 Indian Power Plus. Today is all about getting it started. Volunteer Michael has been puzzling over the Power Plus's many problems. What I've been doing this morning, I've, um, I've, I've satisfied myself that mechanically it's all right. It's down, down to fuel now, so I, I think we ought to go for it. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's do it. In a few days' time, the museum wants to get this bike and a 1914 Harley-Davidson together again to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the first bike in Britain to officially travel at over 100 miles per hour. Trouble is, the Power Plus, which is very similar to the one Bert Levac rode when he tried to achieve the record a century ago, has been rusting away in a barn for decades and won't start. Michael reckons there's a fuel supply problem and Andrew's eager to test his theory. Hi, right, Michael. Yeah. I've got the magic stuff, the easy start. I'm going to try puffing this in mm -hmm. uh, through the air intake, yeah, if sorry. you get it running, and then we'll see if it's not the fuel, maybe it is the fuel not getting through the whole system. So this will, this will cheat the system. Yeah. We'll get an idea. Yep, you heard that right. They're going to use a product called Easy Start. Tell me ready when you're ready. OK. Oh, I'm not ready. The idea is that Andrew squirts this flammable spray into the bike and because it increases the volume of explodable gases in the combustion chamber, the Indian will be much more likely to fire up. Hang on, do you want to go, go one more? Go Again. one more, yep. They have to use a roller starter as there's no starter motor on the bike. Once the back wheel is spinning, Andrew will engage the clutch and hope it prompts the engine into turning over. There, what? that's it, yeah. That that's definitely five. Fantastic. Yeah, that's fantastic. So that now that's really interesting because it that proves that it's the it's the it's got to be the jets. It yes. can't be anything else but the jets. Yeah. Because it's firing on this stuff. The bike only works when Andrew uses Easy Start, which means Michael was right about the Power Plus having a problematic fuel supply. So we know it fires. We know it goes, which is fantastic. So now we've just got to find real fuel to get into it somehow, and that will come from, we'll have to fiddle around with the jets now. The jets Andrew's talking about are in the bike's carburetor, the place where fuel and air mix prior to combustion. This must be the problem, this jet, mm -hmm. because you can see even from the illustration, it shows where, the, where the, you know, the reaction is, and that's adjustable by the throttle opening, but that must be fully closed. That's why there's no fuel. Well, let me open it by one turn. The jets have tiny adjustable holes, and the size of them determines how much fuel is incorporated into the combustible mix. Michael's adjusting these apertures. 
Okay, Andrew, that's a good place to start. Should we give it a go? Let's go for it. Well, I'll take that with me in case we need it. Fire it up. Okay. Uh, ready when you are. All right. Yep. And with a bit more spraying, rolling and jet turning, For the first time in living memory, the bike's engine springs to life under its own steam. High five! Well, don't leave him hanging. High five! I can't believe it works. You see how critical it is, the tiniest adjustment to make that work. It, 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 I moved it that far and it went from not running to running like a train. Now it's running so well, we can't slow it down. Well, that's a good day's work. Well done, Andrew. <laughs> well done, Michael. And well done, Perry. That's down now. You try it, see if it works. Thanks to his wonderful workshop fix and Michael's amazing diagnostic skills, this Indian Power Plus will be headlining the museum's centenary celebrations. And Andrew's stoked. When it fired up, it's just such an amazing experience because, you know, you play with these old vehicles all your life, but you don't think they're really going to work. But it did. It's a, and it's, it's a fantastic feeling, you know, to hear that note. And it sounded healthy. I mean, it was a proper, clean, crisp fire. So, yeah, uh, marvellous. 70 years, and I'm the first one to touch it and get it going since then. It's got to be a good buzz, hasn't it? Well done. Every Brooklyn's aircraft has a tale to tell. Some stories center on military might. Others are about early flight. But this Harrier has a narrative like no other. In 1969, it took part in a transatlantic air race organized by the Daily Mail and won its category. It was a madcap, barnstorming adventure open to anyone. Hundreds took up the challenge, including Billy Butlin, Sterling Moss, and Prince Michael of Kent. For most, it was a bit of fun, but not for the Harrier. The government was keen to showcase this British feat of engineering, the first plane to truly master vertical takeoff. And the Daily Mail race was a chance to demonstrate how ingenious the Harrier was and chalk up some international sales. With this mission in mind, the Harrier's pilot, a then 34-year-old squadron leader called Tom Leckie Thompson, had to get from London's then tallest building, the Post Office Tower, to New York's Empire State Building in the fastest time to win. Here he is getting his race card stamped at the GPO Tower and running to a helicopter that takes him to his nearby Harrier. And today he's come to Brooklands so that his granddaughter, Charlotte Weirden, can see for the first time the prize-winning plane that she's heard so much about. So wow. this is the first time you've approached a Harrier, is it? Yeah, well, this is the first time I'm seeing it. First time you've seen it as yeah. well. That's amazing. Well, is it how you remember it? Yes. Yeah, yes. it looks incredible. This Harrier was originally developed by Hawker Aircraft, who produced hundreds of World War II aircraft on the Brooklyn site. Is this actually the aeroplane that you flew in? Yeah, this is the actual one. Look at the numbers, XV741. That's incredible. Isn't it? We go and have a look inside. Yeah, come on then. Hey, Chris. Hello, Tom. How are you doing? Good Long to time see you again. The man who's kept this Harrier in such fine fettle is Chris Wilson, a professional restoration specialist who worked with his team and completely overhauled the Harrier for its owner, Paul Griffiths, a few years ago. He restored the plane from top to bottom, inside and out. And today the Harrier is in tip-top condition. Did, did you have a lot of work to do cleaning it up? We, we come down and give it a good clean regularly, but we wanted to make sure it looks absolutely spick and span for your visit today. So um, yeah. we, we've uh, inflated the tires, we've cleaned and polished her. Yeah. And um, we've got a few small snags too. 
to you? sort out. We need to uh, we need to find some new tyres because they're oh, they're starting to perish just with the age of the rubber. Oh, but because apart it's from been that, standing still in one place. Yeah, and the rubber, the, the tyres are um, they yeah. have a shelf life of ten years. Once they get yeah. older than that, the rubber starts to deteriorate. Yes. But um, yes. the aircraft's still looking fantastic. It is looking great. Yeah. Is it how you remember it, Grandad? I want to jump in and fly it. Brilliant. <laughs> well, we can get you in the cockpit if uh, if you'd like to get back up there again. Make sure I don't press the wrong button. The uh, ejection <laughs> seat's inert, so it it's done. all safe. There are no flights planned for today. But back in 1969, Tom's race takeoff caused quite a stir. His helicopter landed on a patch of land at St Pancras in London, where his Harrier was waiting. The incredible sight of this jump jet lifting off from inner city London generated headlines around the world. Except that the cockpit of the Harrier was filled up with coal dust and dirt. Consequently, I finished up very dirty, hot and sweaty by the time I finished strapping in. The aircraft lifted off and went away very, very quickly. In fact, I got to the top of the climb and was wondering if my watch had stopped because I'd taken so little time from the top of the GPO tower to there. These days, at 86, it takes Tom, who served in the Suez conflict, a little longer to get into the cockpit. But age hasn't diminished his desire to fly. I can't believe this. I really can't. I'm amazed, absolutely amazed. Is it, what does it feel like being back in there? Does it bring back all those memories? Marvellous, marvellous. I just wish it was real and I could get airborne again. I know. <laughs> Tom's 1969 transatlantic trip in one of the most ingenious aircraft ever engineered was extraordinary. Not least because the Harrier refueled multiple times in mid-air. The downside of vertical takeoff is the amount of fuel it takes and the need to keep the plane light. Tom would have flown at about 683 miles per hour, just under the speed of sound, on his way to the Big Apple. After arriving in New York, he landed at a waterside pier set up by the US Marines. From there, he was whisked away to the Empire State Building on the back of a police motorbike, a ride he recollected in a post-race interview. And this was quite definitely the most difficult part of the whole trip, staying on the back of this machine as it cantered across the rubble, nearly throwing me off. We then charged up to the Empire State Building, being held up by every conceivable traffic lights that there were, and finally punched in the card with a total time of 6 hours, 11 minutes. And 57.15 seconds. Wow. OK. <laughs> You're never going to forget that number. I don't think so, no. <laughs> I don't think so. I guess the Harrier's got a very special place in your heart, then. I'm afraid so. Because <laughs> I don't think I'll ever forget it. Marvellous machine. Marvellous. The most exciting aircraft I've ever flown. Wow. Yes. Tom flew the London to New York leg of the Daily Mail air race in the fastest time. And after an amazing afternoon, his poignant visit draws to a close. I've been shown the area that I used did fly across the Atlantic and it's brought back a lot of good memories to me. A lot of good memories. And it has been beyond special for Charlotte. Seeing his face light up when he was in the cockpit was just incredible. Remembering what the whole day was like, yeah, it was, it was amazing actually. And so much love and care has been put into the restoration. It's just incredible. Chris's hard work on this Harrier has paid off and given Tom, a former test pilot and combat veteran, one more moment in the Harrier he loves. It was lovely to see his face. You know, we, uh, he has a real strong connection with this aeroplane and, uh, you know, to have done all the adventures and the, uh, you know, the exciting, crazy things he did back in the day in this aeroplane to, to help bring back all those memories and, and for him to see the aeroplane once again is uh, quite a special thing to be involved with. Whether it's an iconic jump jet or a classic motorcycle, keeping historic vehicles in top-notch condition is the name of the restoration game. 
At Brooklands, the motorbike team have overhauled an Indian Power Plus. A century ago at Brooklands, a vehicle just like this one tried to become the first motorbike in the UK to reach 100 miles per hour. But a Harley Davidson did it first. Today there's about to be a very good-natured and slightly slower rerun in the exact spot recently rediscovered by the volunteers where the record was set on the railway straight. The Power Plus's owner, Andrew, is keen to get back in the saddle. OK, we're ready to go. Well, I'm, that's a bit wobbly, but I'm going to go with that. Yeah, OK. So set that all up that's... and we're ready to go. Where's the opposition? Race rival John War is riding his own Harley C10. On cue. Oh, John. Hello, mate. All right. How are you? Yeah, good. Let me Thank just park you so much up. for bringing this beautiful thing along. That's all right. What a lovely bike. It's um, 1914 and very advanced for its time. It was the first year Harley ever put floorboards on their bikes. It's got front suspension, um, a sprung saddle. Wow. For extra comfort. That is amazing. Look at that in there. But yeah, having mm. front suspension like that. Yeah. 1914. That's quite mm. advanced. Yeah. Do you want to swap? Uh, <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the bikes are fantastic, and it, it's what is amazing to me is that a hundred years ago, this is what they were doing. Those two buggers came out here, and they were going to try and go a hundred mile an hour on this track, yeah. and uh, they did it. This is not going to happen again. You know, we're exactly yeah. to the to, to the date. One hundred years ago, a hundred miles per hour. It's now or never, boys. Perry and Michael know that it would be nothing short of miraculous for the Power Plus to give the Harley a run for its money. But, thanks to the volunteers, they're at the site of the record-breaking attempt on two period bikes. So, there's really only one thing left to do. <laughs> Did you see that go? <laughs> he got that in gear and it took off. What gear was that? Oh, I don't know. I think he put it in second, but that really went. Yeah. Look at them. Yeah. That's fantastic. Perry and Michael are astounded that the Power Plus is running this well. Can't believe he's Look at Andrew. Andrew's amazing, isn't he? He's just he, he's just gone for it. Yay! Hey! <laughs> They can't believe what they're seeing. The Power Plus has gone from write-off to roaring success, thanks to everyone's hard graft. What a special moment. Very good. It makes all the hard work worth it, doesn't it? Yeah. That was excellent. Behind me. <laughs> God, does it go? <laughs> it's like a rocket. Oh God, it? okay, it's just frightening in, the first time. All in second gear. All in second gear. Oh, well, yeah. God knows what third is. It's 100 mile an hour effortlessly, I should think. <laughs> it was God, brilliant. It. What's happened to the Harley? Oh, oh it broke down. Right on cue. That was brilliant. Well done, old chap. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. What a, yes. I'm glad it was them that did it 100 miles yeah. an hour and not us. Hats off to them, I'd say. See what you boys were going, though. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're brilliant machines. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. That Good was pleasure. a brilliant Onwards. thing to watch. Really was. Perry's right, of course. This centenary won't happen again, but it will live long in the memories of those who were here. This has just been really, really nice and great fun. And so good to see the bikes on the road. It was, it was fabulous to have another bike here because just driving up and down would be enjoyable, but it would be soulless. But to see and feel the other bike and create the sense of the, the rivalry of what happened 100 years ago, fantastic. You couldn't fault it. Was it better than expected? Oh, God, yeah. I, I mean, I wasn't really even sure he'd get it in gear and run it forward. And if he did, he might do one very quick run up there. But it just went. It just went, and myself and Michael were extremely pleased. I was really proud of the Indian. It just performed beyond my expectations, and I look forward to giving it quite a lot more trips.